want to give you a real treat and invite up our fantastic panel to talk about their experiences. Okay, what do I want to do in the next 10 years and where does my skill set map to that over the next 10 years? Don't be scared, it's fine. If you see something is a stretch goal, go for it. Somehow you'll make yourself adjust and reach that goal. I can either go this way or I can go into a completely new direction. Show up with your expertise and your experience and let it shine and you will find the right fit. What's something that makes you feel like you are you, even at the office? Because it's not just about feeling good and being in the room, it's about your opinions actually making it, not just into the room, but being used to influence what's happening in the company. The best suggestion I can have for you is just own your age and make that something about you that's cool and fun and interesting rather than something to be worried about. You should never think you cannot do a certain thing. That's the job of the rest of the world. Let them think that you cannot do a certain thing. You can always do whatever you want to do. I'm like a little teary right now. <laughs>
I build balanced teams. I reject the word diversity because the state of diversity report showed that that word only means something for two groups, white women and black Americans. Literally in Australia, Australians were more likely to say that African Americans were diverse than indigenous Australians. It's weird. Also, I'm here to tell you that black people aren't diverse. They're minoritized, they're underrepresented, they're under-resourced, but they're not diverse, right? So what we've did is we shifted to talking about building balanced teams. Why does this work? It works because, first of all, who is going to die on the hill of building an imbalanced team? Right? No one. The second reason is because it's taking that word that means something we don't mean, something too narrow, and actually allows people from different types of groups in. What if you're Latina, like me? What if you're queer, like me? What if you have multiple disabilities, like me? What if you're over 40, like me eventually? <laughs> and the point is that we were cutting out people who were truly marginalized in ways that we were creating no space for. And what about that straight white man who grew up in a trailer park, who is facing many of the same social challenges that people from visible minoritized groups face? They see the programs as pretty hypocritical, and frankly, that's fair. Because even though they may have experienced structural privilege because of their visible characteristics, they still deserve support and a voice for those things that they need support for. And what we found um, is that it also, I think, the, the critique that I get is, well, how, you, this is obscuring sort of the racial challenges that we have in the industry. And what I found is the opposite. At Atlassian, as we've moved to this language that is less charged, we are actually now able as a culture, as a company, to have more direct conversations about race and specifically about anti-blackness in tech. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, but now I think it's a reasonable question to say, yeah, but how do you do that? It's not just a branding thing, right? This is not just brand repositioning. This is actually about structurally designing the organization to be fair and equitable for everyone. So, but I really believe that the entire field needs a makeover if we actually want to make true progress. So in the spirit of Ariana, this is not a diss track to my ex. This is a thank you so much for that learning experience, but it is time for something new. So we need to move away from diversity, which has a limited meaning and actually is not aligned with the goals that we're trying to build. We need to build balance in our organizations. We also need to move away from inclusion. Inclusion assumes that I can fit like an add-on into a power structure that was built for straight white men, and I have no interest in doing that. I'm not any of those things, and I don't know how to show up that way. I want to actually build belonging. I want to show up in a space where I was considered and where I was thought of. And that doesn't mean, it can be the littlest things that show me that. You'll see here, research shows that women feel like they belong when there's more plants in an office. You'll see that our bathrooms, even the ones that because of building codes have to have gendered words on them, do not actually contain pictures of what a man or a woman looks like. That might not matter to a lot of you. But to folks who are gender non-conforming or non-binary or transgender, that has huge meaning. That little subtle clue actually tells their brain that they belong in that space. And that's what we're trying to build at Atlassian, and I think we can all resonate with wanting to feel like we belong. I'm really, really over the brand and PR version of diversity, where it's like, look, we got intersectional feminism cupcakes, did nothing else but put a photo on Instagram. That's not good enough. I am super pro inter intersectional feminism cupcakes, for the record. We had them for International Women's Day. We just did other things, too. And I think it's time that we design the organization in a way that is structurally equitable for everyone. We need to stop thinking that women equals diversity and embrace an intersectionality for strategy. So how does this look like? It's pretty simple. If I think of someone who has intersectionally marginalized identities, Let's say myself. If I, as a queer Latina woman, can succeed in the organization, any changes that I've made are definitely going to benefit straight white women, too. But when we start with diversity equals women, we only build programs, processes, and structures that help straight white economically privileged women succeed, who certainly face barriers compared to their male counterparts, but we end up further marginalizing anyone who doesn't fit that bucket. And I genuinely, genuinely believe that we can all win together. This does not have to be a competition.
And the last is we have to stop focusing at the company level. I will give you some data later at the company level because it's more meaningful to you. But at Atlassian, we actually look at and report on balance at the team level. You can keep me honest. It's on the website, atlassian.com slash belonging. You can even look at our subjective belonging data if you like. But the reason for that is because that feeling of belonging and feeling like your value doesn't happen at the company level. People don't stay at a company because of the employee resource group. They stay because on their team, their expertise is valued and used. And so we believe that if we give teams the power to create belonging and to see and value and respect people's opinions, that's why people will stay. They will stay, they will do great things, our customers will be thrilled, the stock price will go up, right? It'll be awesome for everyone. So now, how are we actually doing that? So first, we just measure everything. So monthly, I look at hiring rates, and at minimum, we ensure that we are hiring what we call market availability, meaning there is no excuse to hire, be hiring at lower than is available in the market. That's across a variety of metrics, um, gender, race for our US offices. We're primarily an internationally-based company. Um, we look at age, um, and we're looking at uh, getting a better ability to collect other data, like disability and veteran status. We look at promotion velocity, so not just making sure that you're coming in, but are you actually being promoted at equitable rates to your peers? And we look at that by group, by remote versus in office, um, and also pay equity, as it makes sense, right? Just pay people fairly. It's a good idea. You don't get sued and everyone feels valued, um, right? Like, it's a bad idea uh, to pay people inequitably. Inclusion. So every annually, we measure three things in our engagement survey. I feel like I belong on my team. I can be myself at work. And my team has diverse perspectives that influence our decision making. Because we don't want people to bring their whole selves to work, because that's some weird boundary violations I don't want to get into. Or you might have some shitty opinions that are not welcome here. But, right? It's weird, like your whole self. Like, I don't want to bring my whole self. But my authentic self, I do. But that means I get to pick and choose what I bring in. Uh, and then we wanted that diverse diverse perspectives question, because it's not just about feeling good and being in the room. It's about your opinions actually making it not just into the room, but being used to influence what's happening in the company. Right? That tells me whether people's opinions are valued. Um, and the last is attrition. It's a lagging indicator, but if there's a huge gap, right? if some marginalized or underrepresented group is running for the hills, like that's a good sign that something's busted. So we look at and we monitor all of that really closely, and that's how I think about where I prioritize, where I invest. Um, what does that look like programmatically? So everyone always asks me for like the silver bullet, and I'm like, there are none. There's like 500,000 really tiny ones. Um, you need to basically rip out everything about a company and put it back in. So our recruiting team, just in the last couple of years, has developed sourcing libraries. We literally have lists of hashtags, sororities and fraternities, minority-serving institutions, professional organizations. We can find underrepresented people on the internet. But what we're trying to do is solve for the non-negotiable trade-off between time and people who are numerically rarer. We also use structured behavioral interviewing. So we don't ask you questions like how many golf balls fit in a 747, because it turns out that doesn't tell you anything about a person. And we ask the same questions in each interview, because it is very helpful to compare skills when you ask the same questions of all candidates. Um, it also gets rid of bias. We removed culture fit from our hiring, and we talk about values alignment. And in that interview, we look for specific behaviors and qualities that are both predictive of the culture that we want to build, but completely agnostic to your background. Because the fact is, you can learn how to make really effective trade-offs, whether you're running a global P&L function, or you're just getting your kids to soccer and dance and getting dinner on the table. And I definitely don't care how you got that skill. We also look at the balance of our interview panels. Um, so we're right now actually benchmarking all of that to ensure that by the end of the calendar year, no candidate that comes to Atlassian will meet an all-male all, all panel. Um, we're looking at uh, women and non-binary folks as our first sort of measure of balance, and then we'll evolve our approach from there. We use the balanced slate approach. Um, so this is a team-focused way that we ensure that we have underrepresented candidates in consideration for our most senior roles. Um, we have strategic partnerships with organizations like Girl Geeks, um, or we get to meet incredible people, hopefully, that want to be on the team now or someday. Um, we have events and meetups like this. And we also do what I am calling impact brand activations, which is a really good way to say Austin's awesome ideas. So a story about this. I didn't tell you I was going to do this. Um, at Grace Hopper last year, we had a swag budget, just like everybody does. And Austin was like, I have this idea. 
And Austin wanted to do something that was a little bit more Atlassian. So we're big on philanthropy. Our foundation is focused on access to education. And so Austin actually created a giant JIRA board that said, uh, what is it, Women Who Code, Code 2040, Black Girls Code. And instead of getting a t-shirt that definitely is not going to make you have a job here, right? How many of you have ever taken a job because you got a t-shirt? Right? So we actually gave everyone who came to our booth two stickers. One was for them to keep, and one was for them to put under the name of the organization that they wanted us to donate their t-shirt budget to. Why is that awesome? Well, first of all, it helps us identify who's actually going to make a great Atlassian, right? Because if you're pissed you didn't get the t-shirt, you're not a values-aligned person anyway. Um, but we're so big on philanthropy that it, it attracted people who were attracted to that culture, and we created more access for women in tech. Right? So what we did at the end was we counted the stickers and then the proportion of stickers we donated the budget. Um, so that was also just really fun. So these are the things that any company can do, right? No one needs to print t-shirts, it's not a green thing to do anyway. But it's also important to think about the experience that people have once they get here. A lot of people think that this is a recruiting problem and I will tell you it's a culture problem. So this is an example of how we build gender equitable processes. So last year at Atlassian, we completely overhauled the performance assessment process. I know, everyone's favorite time of year. Um, but what we did was we ripped it down to the studs and we said, what could we do to make this as equitable as possible? So traditional performance assessment, you've probably had one. The question is basically, how well did you do with your job? Did you hit your goals? And it turns out that that doesn't take into account the way that you show up, the behaviors that you exhibit in the workplace, and it certainly doesn't take into account all of the office housework and emotional labor that we all do all day, <laughs> right? So what we did was we actually uh, leveraged experimental testing and broke the assessment into three pieces. So now there are three equally weighted pieces of your performance assessment at Atlassian. There is values, which actually has a list of values-aligned behaviors, and you can get a pass-fail. Then there's role, what did you do? And we created a new component called team. And the question here, because we're the team company, was what have you done to benefit your team? So this could be, did you volunteer for a balance and belonging initiative? Are you just that person who's always going the extra mile to help onboard people? Are you the one who's organizing lunch? All of these things count as team contributions, and we wanted to create a way for people who do those things to get credit. I happen to know that underrepresented people do more of that work. But the fact is, it should be rewarded in the same way that writing great code should. And the great thing is that these things are equally weighted in your assessment. How well do you think the brilliant asshole is going to do in that? Not very well. And that was intentional, right? Because we want to create well-rounded people. Um, we also found that by rating each component separately, it reduced the halo effect. So that meant like if you were great at technical role, you would get a bump on values or team. So what we have our managers do is actually rate each component separately, and then an algorithm gives them the recommended rating. Um, so we have the logic for that. So if you get low in any category, you get low, for example. Um, we also use Textio to get rid of the gendered language that could creep into the assessment. So we know that agentic language is more male gendered and communal language is more um, female gendered. And so we remove gendered language at all. So we're not building that into the structure of the system. And last, we named our performance levels using a growth mindset framework. Um, because what it says is that companies that have growth mindset cultures rely less on stereotypes in evaluating people, um, which means that they're less likely to make bias and discriminatory decisions. So at Atlassian, you can't get a legendary. You used to be able to. But now you can have an off year, a great year, or you can have an exceptional year. And the reason is also because we don't want to label you as a person, right? We're talking about how you've done in the last year. Maybe you had an off year because you had a crazy family situation, right? We've all been there. But we believe that you can always improve, and then we're just giving you a check-in on your performance. All of these things together, we combined with a live audit of the system. So we actually audit our performance scores before they're locked to make sure that there's no gaps um, by, from a demographic point of view or differences. So that when Atlassians get their scores, they can be confident that we have checked to make sure that there's not any preventable bias in that. So over the last four years, we've increased by nine percentage points our women in technical roles which is pretty phenomenal when you think about the fact that less than 13% of CS degrees in Australia are given to women, um, and that's our largest engineering center. We've also almost quadrupled in size during that time. So that's really exciting because like two weeks ago, that number was 8.4, and I had to update my slide this morning. Um, yes, it's the best mistake. But 
And that is looking at our technical roles. So we're a very R&D heavy company. So that's probably about 75% of our org. But overall, uh, 30% um, of employees at Atlassian globally identify as women. And now what I bet you're all probably thinking is, yeah, but are they all entry level employees? Um, because that's usually what happens, right? We don't see representation at the senior levels in the same way we they do at more junior levels. And I think the thing that means the most to me is that our senior level representation is actually leading by a little bit. And I think that that's been one of the keys to us growing representation overall is that we've hired fantastic underrepresented leaders, which means that people feel more comfortable coming in because they can see what their career looks like. And if you can't tell, I'm generally a perfectionist and never satisfied with anything. Um, and so there's a lot more work to do. We don't want to pretend like we're perfect, but we do make an active effort here and really want to be seen as someone who's putting a lot of effort and time and thought into it because we know this is an unsolved problem. We won't, we won't know all the answers, but we will share. Uh, and we hope also that you will take some of this, make it better, and then come back and tell us how to improve. So what I'm thinking about right now is building more communities. Um, so we don't have formal ERGs at Atlassian. We actually allow communities to form and then we support them. Um, but we are doing a little bit more strategic investment, especially looking at our black Atlassians this year, um, who last year our data showed that they were having a very different experience, um, even than my other underrepresented um, racial groups in the US. Um, and so that for us is really important to say, nope, that's not OK. If you're reporting a problem, we're going to solve it for you. Um, we're also looking at meetings. So we believe that if you can just improve the quality of how people feel valued and brought into meetings, that we will meaningfully change their work experience. And so we're studying what inclusive practices are happening and figuring out ways to nudge people into more inclusive behaviors. And the last is, we're actually talking about open dialogue. So one of the models we use at Atlassian is what I call open source education. Uh, we have an internal blog. We encourage everybody to use the blog in Confluence, but side by side, where individuals write about their own histories, their own experiences, and how that impacts them at work, with a specific focus on helping their teammates understand how to better support people like them. So we had one of our principal developers in Sydney uh, write a blog called How Not to Fuck Up with Your Trans Teammate. Um, and she wrote that from the spirit of, there's a lot of really wonderful people who don't want to do the wrong thing, and so they do nothing. So she wrote about her experience, and at the end it was like, do these five things. Definitely don't do these, right? Um, or I wrote a blog a couple of months ago because we have a lot of non-American folks. And at the end, it was like, what does black mean? Can I say it? Because the fact is that a lot of people have those questions but are terrified to ask them. And so they just run away from people. And so what we really focus on is creating a space where it's OK to ask questions to learn about how to be more inclusive, which I think is powerful because that doesn't come from me. That comes from our employees. And again, it's so much more motivating to have someone on your team on your team say, you should do this. I just had an engineering manager this morning find a blog about new ways to share your pronouns because we just rolled out a pronoun field in Slack and how to do it in your email signature. And he's like, oh, why didn't you share this to the whole company? And I was like, oh, because people are just sharing it with their teams. And so he went and sent it to all of Bitbucket. <laughs> and so I think that's really powerful because I started seeing all these new things pop up in email signatures, but it wasn't because I did it. It was because people are motivated and they create the community. Right, so they feel bought in and like they did it. So thank you so much for listening to me. But now I want to give you a real treat and invite up our fantastic panel to talk about their experiences. Hi. And that is my dog. He's very codependent. Share my. All right, so the panel knows this. So we have an incredible group of Atlassians from, from different groups, from different sort of career experiences. Um, but instead of having me um, introduce them, which would be far less interesting, um, I'll have them introduce themselves. So are the mics on? It's all good. So That's why good. don't you give us your name, uh, maybe your role, uh, your pronouns for us, and then what identities are you carrying with you today? Okay. My check sounds good. <laughs> okay, so I'm Ritika. I've been working with Atlassian for about two and a half years. I, I like to be identified as she or her. And um, I would say very briefly, I am a programmer by profession and an animal lover by heart. <laughs> I guess that's about it. Um, yeah, but I would definitely want to say all what Aubrey said about Atlassian, having values really ingrained in all the employees is absolutely 100% true. So. Yes. 
Good job, marketing, <laughs> as the marketer. Um, <laughs> so I'm Ashley. I'm a marketer, writer, and speaker by day, and then a singer, actor, fitness fiend by night. Uh, pronouns are she and her. And here at Atlassian, I do a mix of content, social media strategy, and kind of the intersection of where all of those meet at various groups at Atlassian. Hi, I'm Lori. I like she and her. I'm the head of cloud migrations and buyer experience design and content here at Atlassian. I've been here about 18 months. I don't know who that was. It was a shout out in the back. <laughs> oh, it's on my team. And <laughs> yay team. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I'm a native San Franciscan, proud mom of two young adults and a two-year-old golden doodle who sometimes comes to work with me, an avid hiker and a reader. Um, my name is Dominique Ward. I am, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am design operations lead here at Atlassian, uh, which basically means I have the very meta role of helping to enable and unleash the potential of our design team, who then in turn design products that help unleash the potential for our, client, our customers. Um, I identify as a black gay lady, lady very specifically, um, <laughs> a New Yorker, new San Francisco person, but New Yorker, um, <laughs> a systems nerd, an all around nerd, a Barbra Streisand and 90s hip hop and R&B devotee. <laughs> 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 and all of those identities and more wrapped up in the identity of being a Zen practitioner. That's awesome. That was like the best intersectionality discussion I've ever heard. <laughs> um, also, I want to tell you Spotify made a great throwback Thursday's Women of 90s Hip Hop playlist for me today. So. Child, no, that was 2000s. That was 2000s. Yeah. This is like Eve. Eve. <laughs> it's great. Um, so thank you, welcome, thank you for being here. So being successful in your career, as much as I hate taking the negative, is often involves overcoming some kind of a challenge, right, to get to the level that you're at. I'm curious if any of you can tell me about a time when you ran into a roadblock or ran into something and what you actually did to weave around it. Okay, all right, I can start. Um, okay, this reminds me of one thing. Uh, I would, I've been lucky. I've worked with the really good people all my life, but it, this does remind me of um, one thing. So I did my undergrad as a mechanical engineer. All right, that already is hints towards a few things. I was probably amongst the two girls in the entire class. Finally, I had a lot of fun, finished my four years of undergrad, but then I wanted to have a job. So I tried to look for a job, but then there at every single company I sat, uh, I tried to get a job. They either didn't want to entertain female candidates or it was a subtle non-written non rule that fine, you can come and sit, but we probably are gonna just hire male candidates. And I really wanted to get a job. I got to, get, I got to earn money, do something in my life. So then I thought, I, what should I do? Then I, I, as I said, I studied mechanical engineering. So there were a few courses which taught me how to write a few programs to run a few CNC machines. Then I thought, all right, that sounds cool. That was fun. I enjoyed it. I learned a few programming languages, and since then I've been coding. So I guess I think that you should never think you cannot do a certain thing. That's the job of the rest of the world. Let them think that you cannot do a certain thing. You can always do whatever you want to do. So I guess that was a good example I could think of in my life up till now. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so mine was thinking about how to choose among, I was really fortunate to have a couple of job offers um, in my previous round of interviewing. And so I basically looked at, okay, what do I want to do in the next 10 years? Um, and where does my skill set map to that over the next 10 years? And I basically realized that I had a gap in my skill set. So one of the job offers on the table would fill that gap. It was going to be a really stretch role for me. I was probably going to fail when I walked in because it was a huge gap in my skill set. Um, and then the other job was something where it's like, oh, I can hit the ground running. Like, I'm going to knock this out of the park. I'm going to come in and six months later, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we hired this person because she knows what's up. Um, and as I was weighing those, like, it's really tempting to go toward the comfortable job and it's really tempting to go to the place where you're going to be most successful. But if you look down the road and you say, I want to be a VP, or I want to be a CMO, or I want to be a manager, um, or a dev lead, whatever it is, 
where are the gaps in your skill set and take an honest inventory, like be honest with yourself to say, I kind of suck at this one thing. And this person is kind enough to give me a paid learning opportunity and knows that I'm probably going to fail. And they're willing to walk with me to teach me how to do this because they think I have potential. Go toward the thing that's going to stretch yourself. Um, So I ended up taking that job. And it's interesting because my manager and I had several one-on-ones where both of us were identifying that I was like veering toward the place where I was most comfortable. And we both had to work really hard to keep me focused on the skill set that I needed work on. Um, So that would be my thing is just encourage you to take the job that helps you build the skill gap um, and take an honest look at where those gaps are for where you want to go in the future. And Lori, I know you weren't always in design, right? So you eventually made a switch. That's a philosophical debate. I mean, we can do that. I have space for it. What? I said, we can do that. I'll hold space for that. (laughs) Thank you. Um, My first tech role was, my title was technical writer. And I did that for a long time. And many of the jobs involved design of some sort or another. But I was kind of pigeonholed into a certain thing, doing guidelines at a really cool company. Um, But I had kind of hit a wall in my career growth. And I thought, you know, what am I going to do about this? I'm only getting the same kind of opportunities here. And I wanted to do something that challenged myself, grew my skills, and move into an area I was really passionate about, which was interaction design at the time. Now we call it UX or product design or design, whatever we call it. Um, So I put together a little portfolio and I started talking in my company about what other opportunities might there be and was there openness to my shifting roles. And it turned out that there were. I did have to go through the same interview process as the other candidates coming in from the outside. I ended up getting an offer there, but at the same time, all my friends were going to a new cool company called Netscape. I don't know who's here is old enough to remember that, but I thought, oh man, that looks really awesome. That's a really a growth opportunity. So I interviewed there and got a role there. And that started me on this path of being a designer. Um, I had a similar experience, well, multiple. I feel like over the course of my career, it's been the, the periods where I can either go this way or I can go into a completely new direction. And, you know, there have been many moments where I have that, I think the first one that comes to mind is me kind of being a, um, I'm an analyst at heart. And I got a job that I wasn't supposed to get to begin with, didn't even apply for. And then that took me to a design consultancy where I was very purely an analyst on a, on a program management team. And there was a shift in the org and someone asked me, would you be interested in shifting teams? And and I said, sure, I have no idea what I'm doing, but this is the opportunity that ended up kind of propelling me into a new role. I got a bird's eye view of what it took to actually like build and design products that were going into the market and how that ended up impacting a global organization. And that was something that I had no idea that I wanted to do. All I do, wanted to do was work in museums or maybe be a philosopher, and yeah. now I'm here. <laughs> That's great. I have multiple degrees in political science. <laughs> um, very useful. Um, but so a lot of what we've talked now is about your individual choices, but I think most of us who have been in the workforce know that how important the role of your manager is and what that relationship looks like. So, Lori, obviously your team is giant fans of you um, for good re- I mean for good reason but I would love for if you could talk a little bit maybe you can speak to as a little bit of a transition how you realized that you wanted to have a management role because I think sometimes people don't realize that senior level ICs is also a great path and then maybe how do you think about what your role is in relation to into your team mm, okay um, the first management job I had was when I was in college but That was a really long time ago, and it was in a retail setting. And I learned from that that it was really hard to manage other people to performance. And I was, I think, probably too young. Anyway, fast forward a few years in tech, and I went to another really cool company called Netflix, and my boss was taking a leave, a personal leave of absence. And so she and her boss decided that I should do the job temporarily. 
And I said, no, I'm really having fun. And they said, please. And anyway, it went back and forth. And I said, no, a lot. And then they begged. And I said, okay, but only until Nancy comes back. Promise? And they said, yes. Well, it turns out that once I was in the role, I discovered I really loved it. And I was pretty good at it, although I did have a lot of growth and a lot of gap in my skills. So I've gotten a lot of coaching along the way. So that started, and I think this is pretty typical of kind of mid-career people, of bouncing back and forth between man people management and IC, because I did miss the craft. I think that's really hard when you're in a craft role. Um, and then in the last probably 10, 15 years, I've been only a people manager. Um, how I think about my role is I am there to be the servant leader of my team and really in service of them doing their best work and helping them understand where their strengths are, where their opportunities are, where their challenges are, identifying how we can focus on an area they need growth and how we can align their work with their growth needs and leverage all of the um, opportunities and support that we have, especially here at Atlassian. Um, so I make that a regular part of one-on-ones with my team. We also do growth plans here. Uh, it's a regular part we're held accountable for. Are we having those conversations? We get gentle nudges from our people team. Um, and as part of our evaluations, we're held responsible for our teams, at least my boss does, is my team growing, so. Yeah, and I think you have such a great story. Most people don't realize, they know that they can go to their manager for career conversations and things like that. But one of the, the challenges I see is that people don't know that they can go to their manager just to get some support or to bounce ideas off of to help with collaboration situations. And I think you have such a great story around, around how that shows up. Uh, sure, I can share a story and I think a couple of folks in the room might be able to relate to that. Um, so. Being a programmer um, in Silicon Valley, it's not a very uncommon situation when you are the only lady in the room and everybody else is a is a man or is a is a male. So we so I feel that leads that that's great. It leads to diversity. It or or it leads to more balance in the team. I would want to say that. So we're making right it happen me. like fetch. You know, I just as soon as I said diversity, I looked at her balance team. I guess so. I'll keep you no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. But um, but what that leads to is just generally a difference in the way you express your thoughts. And since you are a minority section in the team, it might be different than the rest of the team. So it's not it's after all managers and everybody is just a human being and they also need to it might be possible that they since it was different they didn't recognize it so i have been in such situations i'm sure a lot of other folks in the room must have been in that situation so my really self-tested advice is that talking really helps if you go talk to your manager and tell him or her that this is hey this is what is going to happen this is what is happening and maybe i am getting overshadowed in this uh, area just because my way of expression is different than the rest of the team so that really helps it worked great for me and uh, i would really recommend and suggest everybody to do that if you're ever in that situation so yeah. that's a high level of my story <laughs> And I, I think, because um, we like to keep it real here, is sometimes there's also where I think we've he obviously great managers who, who are, show up, but sometimes, um, sometimes managers aren't the right support structure for you. And I think it's also okay to advocate for yourself in that situation. So I don't know if you want to share, pass the mic all the way down about what that might look like. <laughs> Um, I have been very fortunate to have really great managers, mentors, and advocates over the course of my career and have seen the positive impact that's had to my career development and my how my career trajectory. And when I was in the position of actually being having an issue with the way that I interacted with my manager and their lack of interest in my career development, I then had to make the decision of do I go above them? And I went to HR and also had a very direct conversation with my manager. And after a few months, nothing changed. And so then I had to make the decision on, is this a place where I want to stay? And kind of then start to harbor um, distaste for the company that I'm in, the role that I am, and both that I love? Or do I move forward and try to make a new, a fresh start? And I decided to leave. And 
that was really difficult for me, but ultimately it was the right decision to make. Yeah. I mean, I think they're choosing yourself, right. Can be an empowering thing. If there is a situation that's not serving you, then it's also okay to respectfully say, thank you. Next. Next. <laughs> um, but I want to leave a little bit of time for Q and a for folks here who would want to ask this brilliant panel questions. Um, but if we could go and I will start with Dominique since you already have the mic, your quick tip, if there was one thing that you could tell people that they should do, not just to be successful in their careers, but to be successful in their careers as who they are, what would you tell them? Um, I would say advocate for others and find people who can advocate for you. And that doesn't mean necessarily someone who's above you or more senior to you. It could also be your peers, someone more junior, someone who you can bring their name into a room when they're not there and say, actually, you should talk to that person. And then other people will do the same for you. I'm going to borrow from one of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, who talks about radical self-care. Look it up. It's very important. But the baseline is we give so much. We do the extra emotional labor. We show up in so many ways in all the identities we have. And if you don't refill your tank and take care of yourself, you can't continue to do that with the same level of vitality and impact. I would say mine is to be crystal clear on the unique thing that you bring to the table. So don't get slotted into a box that you didn't choose. Choose your own box and be very clear on why you chose it, how you chose it, what you want to do once you get there. Um, and just be very clear about that anytime you're dealing with, you know, career progression, interviews, those kinds of things. Gosh, just had after so many good suggestions. I don't know if I have that. I have that great insight for the suggestions, but I'll try. I think my the mantra which has worked for me is that um, don't be scared. It's fine if you see something is a stretch goal, go for it. Somehow you'll make yourself adjust and reach that goal. So that has worked well so far for me. I hope it keeps going that way. I mean, I would say so. <laughs> um, my advice is find your squat. So um, I am the DMB team here at Atlassian, and I think one of the things that makes me so happy is not only that I have my squad here, right, folks who help me do the work, but also will be like, I need a walk, right, because we've all had that day at work, and I try to solve structural racism, so as you can imagine, that's easy. Um, but I also have a community outside of work. Um, we have what we call empathy wine with an H in parentheses. Um, and, and I think that's important to have both of those is your, your squad at work who's going to get your context and be able to help you move whatever your goals are forward. But also knowing that having your squad outside of work is incredibly important. I think that is part of radical self-care, right, is making sure that there's always people that you can reach out to and that you actually do it. Please do that. Do as I say, not as I do. Hmm. Um, but yeah, know that your squad is there and pick people who show up when you need them. So yeah, all right. So we have about 10 minutes left technically, and I did not plan who was going to run the mic around, um, but we have wonderful Atlassians here. Um, so if anyone has questions, yeah, do we have another one or another mic? We can, it's cool. It's a team effort. We'll just shift. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I have a question about how you bring your authentic self to work. So maybe just discuss about like what you do choose to bring to work. You don't have to tell us what you don't, but I think like what's something that makes you feel like you are you at the even at the office. Um, Dominique's pointing at me for some reason, so I guess, so, uh, I'm a lot. I straight up told Aubrey, I was like, just be aware, I'm going to try to tone it down. So I'm extremely extroverted. Um, I walk really fast. I talk really fast. Um, one thing that I try to do is to match the energy with the people that I'm working with. Um, I've had situations where just, it, it's not, and it's not like a woman thing that it's like, oh, you're aggressive. It's like, no, you're just a lot for everyone. Um, but I also do musical theater in, as I said, singer, actor, um, fitness fiend. And so um, just the amount of expression and talking with my hands and loud voice that comes across, um, sometimes I can be intimidating to people. So I try really hard to make sure, particularly if I'm managing a team with direct reports, like smile, swing by their desk, talk to them so that every time I come by, they're not like, 
oh my gosh, something is wrong. Um, I do try to intentionally walk slower and smile at people so that they aren't just like, oh, she is on a mission and we are not to speak to her. It's like, no, no, you can speak to me. I just, this is how I walk. Um, but recognizing those things about myself and trying to mitigate them, not because they're bad, just because that's not, I don't, I don't want people to feel like they can't approach me. So that's my story of that. I just wanted to hear you speak more. <laughs> I was to say, I've got a weird answer. Yeah. Um, so if you Googled a photo of me from like two years ago, I would have looked like a McKinsey consultant. No offense to the McKinsey folks in the room. Um, but I think something for me, it was actually started, so when I started at Atlassian, I thought I had to look older um, because I looked five. Um, and I was like, they got to take me seriously. I'm like 26 and have three months of HR experience. Why did they, who was drunk and gave me a job offer? And so I like corporated up um, is the only way I can describe it. It was, you know, like a brown bob and like sleeveless silk blouses um, and like no leopard print heels. And, and that was because I thought I had to be a thing. And something I did over the last year was actually started very slowly incorporating like the way that I would dress myself outside of work. Um, and it ended up with, right, like weird hair and visible tattoos and leopard print. Um, but it was like, I started wearing bright colors and then I was like, you know, it's fine. I'll just dye my hair hot pink. Um, I'm the head weirdo, like it's my job. Um, and then I like got the very visible tattoo that I've been thinking about. And that was something that was really important for me. And I found that I became more authentic in my behavior, um, to people, uh, because I allowed little pieces of myself in first. So that's what I would offer if it's something where you're not sure you're not confident about it yet, um, is to give yourself space to do little bits at a time so that you feel safe and comfortable to show up. Um, cause like I said, you don't have to bring your whole self. Like you get to keep whatever you'd like to private or out of the workplace. But my hope for everyone is that you bring in what you would find meaningful and important to bring in. Hi, thank you for all your talk. I really enjoyed it. So more than a question, maybe I'm looking for a little women's support here. Uh, I'm looking to change my job, so I've been out applying and giving interviews. And so I, I'm a very optimistic, positive person, so I don't want to sound negative, but I'm feeling a... So I've been to at least five, six on-sites, and I'm feeling a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a high expectations because I'm a woman, and also because, you know, I, I never saw... I never realized it, but maybe because I'm in the more higher range in the age. So when I go for an interview, it's only the 20s and the 30s, and I love you all because I was there, you know? They're interviewing me, and I don't know what they're looking for because I feel I'm doing really well, you know? And then they come up with some reasoning which doesn't make sense to me. And I, I know I'm not perfect. I'm an average, hardworking person. I'm not a genius. But I'm at a place where I want to look for a change because I want to. That's I changed. I I'm, I come from a history background, and it was in my 30s I decided to get into IT, and then everybody told me you can't do it, and I got a couple of Sun certifications. I did Java. Now I'm a front-end developer, but I feel that I don't know what I'm missing. Am I missing the buzzwords, or am I not quick enough to do all those classes how they want me to do? But I can still do it because. Every job, if you ask any of my manager, they'll be like, wow, you know, you can, you can do the work. So, so it's a question or advice or whatever I'm looking for. How do I go about it? Because I still have, I still get calls and I know I'll go for more on-sites, but I just need some sort of uh, guidance, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to take questions? Oh, okay. Do you want to Let's ask? do it. Yeah. I'm Hi. I work at Twitch, which is about a yo as young a company as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in my 50s. And what I found when I went into my interview is I owned my age. Like they said, what's your favorite, you know, video game? And I said, well, it's I'm actually older than that. My favorite computer game is Zork. <laughs> and I expected the, the reaction might be, oh my God, she's so old. But what I got was, that's really cool. 
And so the, the best suggestion I can have for you is just own your age and make that something about you that's cool and fun and interesting rather than something to be worried about. I don't think I would have been able to give a better answer, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, I definitely think that one thing, like this, this is Silicon Valley, so I think since you're in IT and I've also been working in IT, I've, you might have more experience and actually I could seek advice from you, but just in my experience, what I've seen is that Silicon Valley giving interviews, getting rejected, going for the next one is a pretty common trend. I think the most important part is not to let it get on to you and just keep trying until you find the one you like and they like you and it would just be fine, I guess. It's just like a regular thing, it'll go on and it'll be over. That, that's what I think. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask the panel um, a somewhat interesting question that is related to this, which is, tell me something that would go on your resume of failures in job acquisition. So I will start and give you an example. When I tried to get into tech, I applied for 127 jobs and got three callbacks. 127 jobs and got three callbacks. So thinking about five or six on-sites, that's actually a pretty good hit rate. <laughs> I graduated into the 2008 recession. Uh, it was terrible. And then I also moved out here. So I'm in marketing, which is really hard to prove that you know what the heck you're talking about until you've been in it for now a decade. Um, so I worked at Starbucks and the like CEO of the failed startup that I was at actually came in to my Starbucks and it was pretty much the most embarrassing moment of my life to have to like serve coffee to this person. Um, to be fair, he failed at a startup, but like as a 23 year old, I was like, this is my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only, uh, any other resume of failures? How long do we have? <laughs> pick, Lori, pick your favorite. I know. Um, I have had many. I've been laid off four times, which is common in Silicon Valley, but it, it feels disruptive and, and diminishing each time. And each time I've landed way better and into a role where I was welcomed and learned more and had a better opportunity. So I say keep at it and ageism is real, but let your star shine out. That's the thing. Like if you show up as yourself and you know, who was it that said? know what you're good at and don't be in the box, like show up with your expertise and your experience and let it shine and you will find the right fit. Atlassian.com slash careers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm contractually obligated. Uh, Can I jump in from a recruiter yes. perspective? We have a recruiter here. Hi, Many. I'm Shauna. I work here. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, potentially controversial opinion. Um, Ask us what the onsite's gonna be about. Recruiters know who's interviewing you, what they're supposed to be talking about, and if they're good at their jobs, they know what questions they're gonna ask you. And if we have the time, we do what we can to prep the candidates. We don't always have the time. We've got 15 roles and 30 candidates for each role. If a candidate asks me to prep them for their onsite, I'm floored. Like I tell the hiring manager that that's happening, that they've asked for it and they've asked for the extra time and I'll take the time if I can. Doesn't mean that everybody can, but if you ask for it, like you'll walk into that onsite way better prepared than you would otherwise. I have a comment and a question. So, oh, thank you. Oh, sorry, I don't do rules. That's okay. Um, my comment for the lady who's interviewing is, um, do from from what I'm I have an age problem <laughs> so I'm on the older side I've been in tech advantage. for advantage yes I guess it is an advantage because I've been in tech for over 20 years so yeah so um but but I would have to say that I'm working with some folks out of college and I've learned so much from them about job hunting so talk to the people that are just coming in, they have different tactics than when I went, got a job when I was in my 20s. One of the guys I work with, he contacts people over LinkedIn. He contacts and call and gets on phone calls with them. So my question is to you guys is, and the recruiter, is that normal? And it's like, I was <laughs> flabbergasted when I heard that, but is that acceptable? And do people get on the calls and have info sessions before the interview? Thank you. I would say, 
think I'm loud enough. Thank so, you. Okay. Um, I would I would like to share like I have had so many people who are especially fresh grads. They've contacted me uh, through LinkedIn. As uh, she mentioned, I don't always have the time, but if I have the time, I'd be more than happy to help anybody and guide them. So if I've been lucky, I'd be more than happy to share my knowledge and steps, the struggles which I went through. If I can help somebody with that, I'd be more than happy. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people would think that way. And if somebody you contact through LinkedIn, I have also tried to contact a few people and get some mentorship. I'm, I think there are people out there who do help you and LinkedIn is a good source. So this is really true and does happen. So to answer that question. Yeah. The advice I would give is do not ask someone to pick their brain. Mm -hmm. um, like that's just so non-specific because it's like if you're busy, if people do this to me a lot, but if someone was like, here's my question. It's like, even if I don't can't make the time to meet with you, I might be able to like type out an answer and help you. Yeah. So asking someone for a specific thing they can help you with increases the likelihood that you'll get something helpful out of it. Right. And. Uh, Sorry, one last thing which I wanted to add was that when somebody contacts me, I if somebody puts in a little extra effort to say, hey, I've tried this, 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 this is not working, this is what I'm interested in, that, that gen genuinely shows me that, that she or she is really interested and I can't spare a minute of my life to help him or her. And most cases I do that. So I think a lot of people would do that. So yeah. So yes, they do it. And sometimes it's the mom network that puts them up to it. <laughs> And so, you know, having young adult kids and trying to help them land, a lot of times I'll just talk to my friends and say, my child is interested, my young adult is interested in thus and such. Would you be willing to talk to them about this and that? And then I make them make the contact. But just in the last two weeks, I've had coffee with two different people that I peripherally know who are interested in Atlassian. And they said, oh, you're at Atlassian, would you help me prepare for my interview? Or can you tell me what it's really like to be there about this and that thing? <laughs> Dominique, what about you? Um, in my past life, I have had many um, new grads or I'm, I need an internship reach out to me for roles that I have no, like, connection with of really just kind of like trying to get in, in the door and have a, and have a connection because they know that m you're more likely to get an interview or get your foot in the door and get your resume seen if you are a referral and so young kids are very savvy <laughs> that's true. i mean i think that's so oh, we'll do one more question because i want to be mindful of everybody's time so Yes. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia. I have a question for Aubrey. Um, you know, when you think of building balanced teams and this whole idea, a lot of conversations I've had with people in this field, they always say it starts from the top. And I work for a company that is very white male at the top. And I'm just curious if you agree with that. It starts with them. And if so, how do you go about getting them on board with all that you're doing? My first thought was like, oh, you work at a tech company? <laughs> um, it's true, right? Who gets funded 20 years ago is who's running companies now. So I think it does start at the top, but I also think um, what I'm seeing candidates do a lot right now is they simply just look at the representation of the executive team and then decide whether the company cares about d &I. I think that's actually not a complete heuristic. Like, I don't think you should use that as the only signal, um, because if you've ever tried to build an engineering center in Sydney, Australia, um, well, just try that and then try to have a balanced executive team um, because of the historical legacy of that. So I think it's a useful heuristic, but what's more important is actually asking what the executives are doing to help build balance. So I, I don't think he'll get mad at me for sharing this. So for example, about a year ago, I have flagged to our, so both of, we have two CEOs and they're Australian. Um, and so I basically flagged to him. I was like, hey, and we've had a lot of conversations about him being a straight white guy. And I was like, hey, our black employees, um, like, do not feel like they are, like, they are not having the same experience as other people. It's showing up in our data. Latinx folks, we're all happy. Um, and, and I said, one of the things that's coming out in the comments is that they don't feel like leadership is advocating for them. And we had a really frank conversation. And he was like, oh, fuck. And he's like, no, but I do care. I just don't know what to say. I was like, all right. Well, why don't we give them voice? Like, why don't you take, so he literally sat down for an hour and every one of our black employees was invited to call in and just talk to him. And he was awkward and he got rules about what he was allowed to ask versus not. <laughs> um, and he was perfect. He walked in and he's like, I have heard that you don't feel like I'm advocating for you and I'm 
nervous and I don't know how, but I'm trying to understand and hopefully you'll, you know, help me figure it out and please believe I'm trying to do well, but tell me when I'm not. And we had a really raw, uncomfortable, honest conversation. And now, um, so that happened last year. And then he and I were preparing to give a keynote in Europe. I promise this has a point. And so in Europe, like the word race is very different than here, right? Like if you use the term race in English, it's like very Nazi adjacent. Um, so a lot of our European counterparts don't even feel comfortable saying the word race for that reason. And so I never say things like people of color when I'm giving a talk in Europe. Um, this is for our user summit. I'm in like a private rehearsal with like some VPs and, and Mike. And he's like, and I listed a bunch of underrepresented groups. And he's like, why don't you say people of color? And I was like, well, because it's Europe and the market doesn't get it. He goes, yeah, but our employees are going to hear it. You have to put it back in. And so I think that that's the stuff that's important. Um, because the fact is like our CEOs are straight white men who are billionaires. But they back me up in the room when I'm not there. Or they are like, Mike is like, no, our black employees are going to hear that we didn't say that, and that's not acceptable. And so I think that those are the things you should ask about, and that's what you should do as a candidate. So right, don't ask, like, does your company care about diversity? Like, yes, of course we do. Ask, and don't be like, what programs do you have? Your average hiring manager won't know. But what you can ask is something like, what have you done to help people have more of a voice? How do you try to include people? Like, that's something anyone should be able to answer. Um, so that's what I would say. But I also don't think starting at the top is enough. At Atlassian, the reason we've been successful is because our leadership gets it. I do not justify my job here. Um, we talk about how. But also because our culture and grassroots support it. There's so many things that have been built in this office that were just built by Atlassians. Like, I had nothing to do with it. And that's the mark of success is when I'm useless. Um, so I think, I think it's that. It has to be top down and it has to be bottom up. Um, I wish I had a, like a more helpful answer, but that's it. Yeah. Can I say one thing? Please. Um, so I just started two months ago, and and Aubrey did my onboarding, and before we even started, she gathered the new people, and we were going upstairs, and before we even went in the direction of the stairs, she said, "Are stairs okay for everyone?" Did I do that? Yes. I mean, it sounds like a thing I would do, but I'm so <laughs> thrilled I did that. And that, I mean, as someone who like. Uh, disability rights and, and accessibility is really important to me. Like that was a very subtle thing of that she could have done that just even just like, you know, it was like, okay, I'm in the right space. Because even though I accepted the job and heard about the values, I'm like, eh, is that really what it is? I'm like a little teary right now. <laughs> Anyone on my team will tell you I cry all the time. <laughs> Oh, that makes me so happy. I feel like I want to end on that note, but it's a little weird and self-serving. Um, so what the note we probably should end on is an enormous thank you for the absolutely fantastic, brilliant panel that you have in front of you. And also claps for all of you who showed up tonight and for all the things that you're doing, because the fact is that you're really the future of tech, and I'm so grateful that you're all here.